Well, moms, today is your day. It's a day to say thank you for loving us, caring for us, and guiding us. It's a day to recognize all you do and all you are to us, your perfect, wonderful, amazing children. Thanks for all the early mornings and for taking care of the things we take for granted. Thanks for never giving up on us, even when we stress you out. Thanks for making sure we have what we need and for giving us your heart even when you're sick and tired. Thanks for working hard even when we're a handful and for loving us unconditionally when our attitude is anything but lovable. You're our everything, Mom, and we'd be a mess without you. Today, we thank God for the wonderful gift of you. Happy Mother's Day. For all of the moms who are viewing, let me joyfully say Happy Mother's Day to you. I hope that today is in fact a Mother's Day that is enjoyable. Let me pray for all of you. Dear Heavenly Father, today I want to say that I am grateful for my mom and I thank you for her and I'm grateful for my wife, the mother of my children, and I thank you for her. God, it is a privilege to intercede for all of the mothers right now, asking that you would meet them in their needs, that you would bring joy to their hearts. God, we know that today is a, a joyful day for many, and we pray that they might have the fullness of that joy. And we know that today is a very discouraging and a very difficult day for many women. And God, we pray that you would meet them in that. Would you be the compassionate God that they need today? God, we pray that for all of us, that we would rec recognize that today is an opportunity to remember that we need to put our eyes onto the Lord. You are the one uh, that we focus on. And God, we pray that today we would have humility and that we would recognize that we are your servants. In so many ways, moms have typified that joyful servanthood of honoring you first and doing what it takes to minister to others. And so God, we honor them today. We pray that they would find fulfillment in following Jesus and that you would draw near to their hearts and encourage them today. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Good morning, it's Mother's Day. And for me, Mother's Day has always been about celebration. I had the blessing and the privilege of having a wonderful mother. But this year is different. And so instead of celebration, for me, this Mother's Day is marked by loss. In December, we lost our second grandchild to miscarriage. And in January, my mom died. And I found myself this week thinking, I don't want to do Mother's Day. And then I began to think about some of you and maybe how Mother's Day can represent loss for you. I thought about death and miscarriage. And then I thought about quarantine and geographical distance and illness and dementia and Alzheimer's, abuse and abortion, adoption, addiction, divorce, broken and strained relationships, unforgiveness, infertility, so many things that can make Mother's Day something other than a day of celebration. And not just for the mom, but for the child. Because although we call it Mother's Day, it touches all of us because none of us are without a mom. I wondered, what am I gonna do about this loss this Mother's Day? It's not overwhelming, but it's there. And I sat to pray earlier this week, and actually unrelated to this thought about loss of Mother's Day, I surprised myself in prayer when I said out loud, God, I don't think I bring my true self to you when I pray. I come and ask you to do things that I think will make it better. And then I had my thoughts run on towards Jesus and what he did when he was in the depth of pain and sorrow in the Garden of Gethsemane. He just poured out his heart to the Lord. 
Scripture tells us that he knew, knew he was coming intentionally to empty himself. He himself said he came to fulfill the law and the prophets and the Psalms. He knew he was going to die. He told his disciples he would be betrayed and mocked and beaten and crucified. And in the garden, he asked three times, three times, if it is possible, will you let this cup pass from me? But not my will, thy will be done. And in his pain and in his request, God's answer was no, the cup wouldn't pass. But having poured out his heart, his human heart to the Father in all its rawness, Jesus was able to go to the cross and move on to the victory that God has planned and established. And so that's what we can do this Mother's Day. Whether your Mother's Day is full of joy and celebration or whether it carries sorrow for you, Jesus wants to be in all of it. He invites us into all of it. So have him there in the happy times. And if you're hurting, pour your heart out. Jesus wants to be there too. So for this Mother's Day, with whatever it holds for you, know that Jesus wants to be there in the joy or in the sorrow. It cries you are.
how great thou art. When I in awesome wonder Consider all the works thy hands have made I see the stars, I hear the rolling thunder Thy power throughout the universe display Then sings my soul be serious here. There's coronavirus. Most of us are not in the mountains. We aren't through the woods or the forest. Um, let's try this for you moms, all right? When through the house and bedroom doors I wander and hear the kids fussing once again. When I look down from lofty dreams of grandeur, I see my need of rescue for my sin. Right? Serious here. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee. How great thou art. Thou art 
then sings my soul, my Savior God, to Thee. How great Thou art, how great Thou art, how great Thou art, how great Thou art. morning, Redemption Hill. We're continuing our series on the essentials, truth when all else fails. 
And uh, specifically, we're continuing to look at uh, that essential life rhythm of loving God and loving others. And I want to I want to focus on the idea of servanthood this morning. That's so central to what it means to be a follower of Jesus, so central to what we're called to do. And, um, and I was I was thinking about that, and I, I remembered a book that I'd read some time back, and I, I pulled it out, and I just want to read a few verses because it seems particularly fruitful in this moment. Uh, a historian is talking about the Roman Empire and how things went, and he says, again and again, the forward march of Roman power and world organization was interrupted by the only force against which political genius and military valor were utterly helpless, epidemic disease. And when it came, as though carried by storm clouds, all other things gave way, and men crouched in terror, abandoning all their quarrels, undertakings, and ambitions until the tempest had blown over. Wow. Wow. Mighty Roman Empire was brought to a halt because of disease. Well, I think we can relate to that. The whole world is ground to a halt of some sort anyway right now because of this pandemic. And it's taking a toll. The economy of the whole world is suffering. Sickness is doing damage. Um, earlier, just a week or two ago, the, the projected deaths in the United States were half of what they are now. Seems like it's picking up speed in some way again, and there's a number of reasons for those numbers going up, but it's disturbing to see well over 100,000 people will likely lose their lives from this disease in the U.S. alone, and it could be a lot more than that. There's this development in the East where some children are developing side effects that are drastic and, and, and life-threatening. I was talking to a neighbor the other day who's a nurse in a hospital here in town, and she works in the post-op unit where people are coming out of their surgeries, and she said it's it's been changed to now be one of the COVID units, and it's been really, really hard because people that go through their unit are always getting better. They've come out of surgery, they're going to recuperate, and then they're going to head home. And now people are coming in and some of them are actually being brought in because there's no further hope and it's just palliative care until they pass. And this whole unit is having to deal with death after death after death. We're in a pandemic and that's a terrifying thing. That's a difficult thing. And, and, and during this time, it hits us in different ways, but it hits every single one of us. And um, I think we, we've clung to, many of us, the verse in Romans 8 that says, God works all things together for good to those who love him, to those who are called, called according to his purpose. But it's a fair question to say, how might he be working this for good? And I wouldn't presume to guess all that God might be doing in, around, and through this horrible situation that has come up. But I do think one of them actually has to do with growing us as servants to be more like Jesus, who was a servant, and allowing us to serve the world in a way that can make a pretty significant difference. The book I was reading from a minute ago is called The Rise of Christianity, and it's by a sociologist who's looking at how did Christianity move from being this marginal, tiny little movement in the middle of the first century to by the early 4th century being the dominant worldview in the empire. How did that happen? That's awful fast. That's awful significance. That's a huge transformation. And we know, of course, there are divine components of this. It's a work of God. But at a human level, he's tracking what are the human dynamics going on. God does, after all, work many times through human dynamics. And it really, in many ways, comes to... Christians going through a hard situation like we're in right now and responding as servants. Because in that context, the gospel had explosive power. As Christians dealt with their own anxieties and struggles and fears and said, I'm going to be like Jesus, I'm going to trust God, and I'm going to, I'm going to serve those around me. They were blessed. And the world was explosively transformed because they stood apart from the world around them um, 
one of the people he quotes is a pagan emperor who complained that uh, the pagans just weren't keeping pace with the Christians in terms of their moral character. And by that he meant their love and service of others. Um, he said, quote, benevolence towards strangers and care for the graves of the dead. That was one of the areas they focused on. They, they cared for people they didn't even know. And, and even the graves of people who had died, they, they showed them respect and they, and they took care of them. Um, he, he writes further, I think that when the poor happened to be neglected and overlooked by the, the priests of the pagan religion the emperor was a part of, these impious Galileans, in other words, the Christians, observed it and devoted themselves to benevolence. And he goes on in another letter and he says, um, we can see that our people lack aid from us and these people, these Christians, actually care for our people too. It was their love, it was their service that God used in such a powerful way. Further on in the same book, quotes a Christian author from the period of these plagues who said, um, it is our care of the helpless, our practice of loving kindness that brands us in the eyes of many of our opponents. Only look, they say, look how much they love one another. God may do many things through this terrible time, but I think one of the things he wants to do is to stir us up to say, what are the foundational essential components of life? And one of those foundational essential things is a rhythm of life that looks like Jesus, that's servant-oriented, right? In Philippians 2, we're told the mindset of Christ is what we're supposed to have, the mindset of a servant who he didn't, he didn't cling to his privilege and he didn't fight for his rights, but instead he became a servant and he sacrificed for the sake of others. The purpose of my life is to be like Jesus. It's to know him, to grow in this intimate relationship with him and be transformed to be just like him. To be like Jesus is to be a loving, redemptive servant. And this time that presses all of us in so many ways, it presses our hot buttons, it presses our anxiety buttons, it presses our fear buttons, it strains us with the relentlessness of, of confinement and the seemingly endless rules and the concerns about what's going to happen financially and the separation and the isolation and the loneliness, all these things that we're facing press us to the very borders of our endurance. And in doing that, they also open our hearts. And I think one of the key things God wants to work on inside of us is to grow us as servants, to say, I want you to choose servanthood in the middle of all of this. You choose servanthood, you'll be like Jesus, and you just might change the world. Let me read you some verses. I'd like to direct you to Mark chapter 10 going to just focus for a couple of minutes in that chapter for just a few verses. But in order to get there, I want to read you a, a, a number of other verses. So you'll be in Mark 10, and I'm going to read starting first in Titus. It says, Jesus Christ gave himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness and to purify for himself a people for his own possession who are zealous for good works. The next chapter in Titus he says, this is a trustworthy saying, and I want you to insist on these things. Titus is a pastor, and, and Paul's instructing him, with your people, I want you to insist on these things so that those who have believed in God may be careful to devote themselves to good works. I want them to devote themselves to good works. Insist that they do that. In all that's going on, focus on doing well for others. These things are excellent and profitable for people. And then he goes on to say, actually, they're, they're involved in things that aren't excellent, that are terrible, that are worthless, and that are totally unprofitable. And he talks about the arguments and the, the endless wranglings and the fighting and the sowing of dis, discontent and dissonance within the family of God as they wrestle instead of serve. And he says, Titus, I want you to insist on these things. People are to be zealous to serve. In um, Galatians, 
Paul says this, Let's not grow weary of doing good. For in due season we will reap if we do not give up. So then as we have opportunity, let us do good to everyone, especially to those who are of the household of faith. Let's not give up. Let's not wear out. Let's stay with this. Let's find ways to serve our brothers and sisters in Jesus and everyone. Now, Mark chapter 10. If you have your Bibles, I'm going to start in verse 43, but just to get the context, there's just been a power play by the disciples. James and John try to try to get privilege. The other disciples get mad because everyone wants to be in the number one position, and Jesus is trying to address their hearts because they have these um, prideful, self-seeking hearts, and he's got to he's got to flip that. He's got to show them that's not the heart you're to have. That's the way pagan rulers live. That's the way Gentiles live. Not you. You don't do that. And here's what he says. Whoever would be great among you must be your servant. That's verse 43. Whoever would be great among you would be your servant. Whoever would be first among you must be slave of everyone. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give thanks. I'm sorry, to give his life is a ransom for many. Basically, he tells them, look, you need to choose to be a servant. That's why I'm here. I've chosen to be a servant. And, and he addresses actually two things. It's subtle, but it's clear. Uh, there's a heart of a servant and there's the hands of the servant. And it starts with the heart, right? And the heart of a servant is to choose to surrender. If I'm going to choose to be a servant, I need to choose to surrender. Jesus says, even the Son of Man didn't come to be served, but instead to serve. When he used that word even, he said, this is surprising. You wouldn't think this. I mean, after all, if there was anyone who was supposed to be served, it would be me. But even I didn't come for that purpose. I surrendered that. I've come to serve, not to be served. And he calls himself the son of man, which is a lofty, lofty title. That's the, that's the being who came out of heaven in Daniel chapter 7 to rule the whole world. It's like, I'm that guy. If anyone should be served, it's me, and even I didn't come for that because I have chosen to surrender so that I can be a service. That's the heart of a servant, and that's what he calls us to. He chooses purpose over privilege, right? Instead of, instead of seeking his comfort and guarding his comfort, he seeks to care for us. Instead of seeking security and guarding security, he seeks to serve us. He sees his role as I'm here to serve, and he pursues that. And then he says, if you're going to follow me, that's, that should be your ambition. Right? It's not, even, um, it's not even a marginal thing. It's something I want you to be ambitious about. Set your heart on this. Pursue this. Uh, you know, we should be ambitious for certain things. But as followers of Jesus, you know, we're also supposed to be humble. How does that work? Well, here's one authorized ambition. Be as ambitious as you want to about being a servant. I love the tombstone that sits on the grave of A.W. Tozer. Some of you will recognize that name. He was a, he was a pastor and a leader um, and a writer, uh, middle of the last century. Very, very influential. And on his tombstone, it simply says, A.W. Tozer, man of God. And I think that's awesome. What I'd like on my tombstone, I think, would be just slightly modified. modified. That'd be Robert Bishop, servant of God. To have that etched in stone so that people see that's the message his life proclaimed. And I only want it there if it's actually real. But if it's real, I think that would be a wonderful way to be understood. That would be a wonderful identity to have preserved. He was a servant of God. In fact, as people are reading that in my headstone, I want to be hearing that in heaven. I want to be hearing, well done, good and faithful servant. Because that's what God's called me to. And he's not called me to just go out and do a bunch of active things. Sometimes people get so focused on just do, 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 do. Somehow I'm going to earn God's favor. That's not what it's about. It's about as I grow in relationship with Jesus, the Holy Spirit works in me to make me like Jesus. Jesus is fundamentally a redemptive servant. Servanthood will come bubbling up out of me. Am I going to go with that? Am I going to commit myself to that? Am I going to pursue that? Am I going to allow that to be one of the ways I love God 
you know, loving someone requires me to respond in some way. I can't help myself but respond in some sort of action. How do I respond to God? Well, I can worship, I can pray. There's all kinds of things that I can do. One of the key things is if God loves people so much, he would love it if I would love them too. I would be a servant. Jesus says, I, I didn't come to be served. I came to be a servant. And, and if you want to be great, that's what I want for you too. And I want you to choose to surrender. I want you to have a heart of a servant. Choose to surrender. Make this your ambition. I have a phrase that I actually try to live by because I find it helpful in this. I want to be the number one servant. I want to be the number one servant in my home. I want to be the number one servant at church. And I want to be the number one servant in the world. By that, I don't mean it's competition. I'm number one, which means you're at best number two, your first loser. It's, I don't even know how I would measure that, and it's not about that. Nor is it, oh, there's three people ahead of me. I'm the fourth best servant in the room. I need to get my act together. That's, that's not what it's about. It's not a competition. It's a commitment. And it's a, a cast of soul that I'm seeking to cultivate by God's grace to say, um, that's the way I think. That's the way I approach the world. That's the way I engage with my family. That's the way I engage with church. That's the way I engage with the people around me. And you know what? God uses even that, making that specific choice, that specific goal of being the number one servant, sometimes to prompt me. Um, there's an inertia that moves down from my shoulders to about two feet lower where my wallet sits. You know, the inertia of the rear end planted in the couch. Um, and the first rule of servanthood of motion is a rear end planted in the couch tends to take roots, right? And so it's easy sometimes to just sit instead of get up and serve. And um, there are times, perfectly appropriate times for rest. I certainly need to spend a lot of time just quiet before the Lord. Servant, servanthood is not at odds with just deep devotion and intimacy with God. It's, it flows out of that. But there's a time when I need that nudge from God to say, uh, your rear end shouldn't be there. Instead, it should be in motion because if you want to be number one servant, this isn't what it looks like in this moment. Jesus said, I, I didn't come to be served. I came to serve and I want my followers to be ambitious for that. A time like this is actually not dissimilar to seasons within the early church when massive change happened because of how they responded and how they pursued growing in Christlikeness by growing as servants and how it impacted the world around them. The heart of a servant is to choose to surrender. Then the hands of a servant, that's to choose to bless. I need to have hands that are always looking for an opportunity and always ready for an opportunity to bless. I can't bless everyone, every situation, every time. That's crazy. I am not God. I'm not supposed to fill that role. But there needs to be this, this disposition to do something to bless somebody else that I cultivate. And it's not, it's not a theoretical thing. It's not a virtual game that I play. It's dirt under the fingernails reality that I need. And sometimes as followers of Jesus, especially from the stream that we, many of us come from, it's easy for us to be zealous for good words. We love the word. We love theology. And we can read it and we can study it and we can talk about it. But it doesn't say he's come to make for himself a people zealous for good words. He's come to make a people zealous for good works. Now, we need to treasure the Word of God. We need to dive into the Word of God. We need to devour the Word of God. But then we need to live out the Word of God. It needs to sink from our heads into every cell of our body so that we actually have a hand that is ready to bless. To be a servant, the hand of a servant is to choose to bless. When it says, um, don't grow weary in well-doing, that must mean it's possible. It must mean there's some action that's going on that makes it possible to grow weary. I can't be a servant without verbs. And this passage of Jesus is anchored in verbs, right? He says the Son of Man came. That's an action. To serve is an action. To give his life is an action. I need to choose to bless. 
maybe there's an opportunity that you have right now where you could bless. Um, it doesn't have to be fancy. It doesn't have to be obvious. It doesn't have to be celebrated. Sometimes the simplest things are the most powerful things. And actually, we all saw one in our culture recently. It turned out to be celebrated, but I'm convinced that's not why they did it. The farmer in the Midwest who had five protective masks and had four family members, and so he mailed it to Andrew Cuomo. And the only reason we know about it is because it was so moving to Cuomo that this man's heart of being a servant, this man's hands up to bless, moved him. That he read it at a read the letter and showed the mask at a at a news conference, and then the media tracked down the farmer and interviewed him at his house. And I'm sure I'm sure that was an overwhelming experience because he never intended that. He just had a heart to be a servant, and then he had hands that were ready to bless. And he had, this is what I've got. I've got one mask. Please use it. Please give it to a nurse or a doctor or some other medical professional so they can protect themselves. It can be a simple act. Um, we're at home, confined, close quarters. This is a really good time to look for ways to bless those that you live with. It's Mother's Day, by the way. Today's a really good day to find a way to bless mom. But every day is a good day to find a way to bless mom to bless dad, to bless your husband, to bless your wife, to bless your brother or sister, to bless your kids, to bless your housemate. Maybe you're just alone. Maybe there's a way that you can use your phone or your computer or even drop something off in an appropriate way, drop something off that bless somebody. And to bless is part of choosing to be a servant. Um, last week we had people get really creative and there was a whole parade driving by our house uh, shouting and holding up signs and honking their horns at us. You might call it a drive-by tooting. Um, and it was all to encourage us and it was incredibly encouraging. Now that took a lot of work, a lot of logistics, a lot of effort. Um, I appreciate it deeply. For those of you that did that, that's wonderful. Thank you. You may have some bandwidth to do something a little more creative, something a little bigger in somebody's life. I'd encourage you to go for it. I, <laughs> somebody actually gave me coronavirus because of their love for me as their pastor. You would think, why would you do that? Well, um, they crocheted this, this little model of the virus, right? And, and, and it's so powerful to me because, one, it, it's a horrible thing that I'm holding in my hand here. It's a model of something that's devastating in this world. And yet in the midst of that, somebody thought of me, thought of my wife, thought of my family, and gave us, used their talent to, to give us this, to say, even during the midst of this, I want you to know I'm thinking of you, praying for you, I love you. They were cho choosing to use their hands to bless. What's God put in your hands? How can you bless? You know, I think one of the things that I've learned is that we can't um, do this out of like, because I won't like everyone around me. Sometimes it's very difficult. We're told to love our enemies, not to like them. I may not be in control of that, but love is a, an action that I can take to bless. So I need to anchor this in love. And uh, that's really what Jesus said when he told the story of the Good Samaritan, right? Two people who had nothing in common with each other, the injured man and the Samaritan, other than their culture's mutual despising of the other culture. And yet one man had a need, and so the other one chose to bless. He loved. He loved. I need to do it for your need, not for mine. I've seen this happen over and over. People will do something because it meets their need. They're excited. I need to do something. I'm bored. I've got, you know, and, and that's not a bad place to start, at least not necessarily. Sometimes it may be, but other times it's very appropriate. Serving does meet my need, but at some point the center of gravity has to shift so that it's not really about me meeting my need. It's about me seeking to meet yours. I remember having a conversation with an insightful leader a number of years ago. He's since gone to heaven, but we were trying to figure out how to help somebody in the congregation who's also since gone to heaven. And um, it was one of those insightful conversations. It was a caring conversation, nothing at all inappropriate about it. But he did make a comment that was really cut to the point. He said, I wonder why this person is doing all the things they're doing, because they were super generous and super heroic in so many ways. And he said, I wonder what need in themselves they're trying to meet. 
sometimes uh, servanthood's not actually servanthood. It's selfishness. And there's nothing wrong with saying, hey, I've got some ability. I'm interested. I'd love to be involved. I, I'm kind of excited about this. But at some point, the center of gravity needs to be, it's not really about me meeting my need. It's about me meeting your need. When somebody says, you can count on me, that's not always true. When you say, you can count on me, is it true? How high can I count? One, two, three. Oh, they're gone. Uh, that happens all the time. People start well but don't finish well because it's about a need they're meeting for themselves sometimes and not the need they're meeting for the other. Jesus says, I didn't come to be served. I came to serve. I, I adopted this mindset of a servant, so I chose to surrender, and then I started living that out through actions. I chose to bless. I have the hands to bless. Another thing I think is important is that we seek it out, not just wait for it to come to us. Um, Sometimes I just need to look a little bit wider and be a little bit more creative because maybe the biggest need isn't going to be obvious, but if I search for it, I'll find it. Years ago when I was learning to play football, I was on a Pop Warner team, and I guess I must have been pretty good as an offensive lineman because I remember one of the first games we're in, uh, we lined up, the ball was snapped, and I fired out of my stance, and the defensive player was laying on the turf looking up at the sky. Second snap of the ball, fired out of my stance. The defensive player was on the turf looking up at the sky. Third snap of the ball, I fired out of my stance. The defensive player was on the turf looking up at the sky. Fourth snap of the ball, I fired out of my stance and took three or four more steps, and there was nobody there. And I stood up, and I looked around, and he was gone. He decided he wasn't going to get through me, so he just went a few yards laterally and went through a hole somewhere else and so I would fire out of my stance but there'd be nobody there and so I just wind up standing there the whole play and then eventually you know, three or four snaps is all it took before I just the ball snapped I just stood up coach called a timeout pulled me over what are you doing I said well I, there's nobody there he, he he's not trying to go through me I, I'm I'm guarding the line nobody's coming through me yeah that's good but he's coming through somewhere else, and your job isn't just to guard the territory in front of you. It's to protect the quarterback, and he's getting knocked down. What do you want me to do? I want you to go out there and find somebody and hit him. That was great advice for football. Maybe the advice for being a servant could be modified slightly from that and say, go, go out there, find a need, and meet it. Not every need is going to come to me. Sometimes I need to develop insight. I need to pray. I need to be creative. I need to look. There may be somebody right in front of me who has a need, and they're never going to tell me for whatever reason. But if I'm discerning, I might be able to find it, and I might be able to meet it. And I don't need to wait for a need to come to me. I can go and find it. Jesus said, I have not come to be served. I've come to serve and give my life as a ransom for many. God said, adopt this mindset that Christ had. He didn't cling to everything that was so wonderful for him. He let it go so that he could serve. Am I choosing to be a servant? If I choose to be a servant, I choose to be like Jesus. And I may just choose to do something that could change the world. My prayer is that however long this goes on, however complicated, whatever returning to normal looks like, whatever new normal is, one thing that would have changed long term within me is I would have grown deeper in being like Jesus as a redemptive servant and that you would as well. Lord Jesus, I thank you that you didn't come to serve or to be served, but to serve and to give your life for me and for everyone who's watching this too. I pray that we as your people would be like you, that we would have a heart to serve, and that we would have hands to serve, that we would surrender our agendas and would be ready to bless those around us. I pray this in your name. Amen. Let's respond by asking God to search our hearts. Search my heart, I want to be faithful. Take this pride, I 
wanna be humble. Come search my heart. I wanna be peaceful. Bless me with love. I wanna be overwhelmed with you. With you. With you. With you. Search me. Oh God, know me. Search my heart and know my thoughts. Search me, my desire is you. Search my heart, I want to be faithful, take this pride, I want to be humble, come search my heart, I want to be peaceful, bless me. In 
in your eyes. 